have a critical mass of participants. Um, so it is uh, 10.04 a.m. Um, so I will go ahead and get started uh, with my part, which is, is not necessarily substantive. Um, I am uh, Nikkel Allen. Um, I'm the Director of Open Government with the Office of Open Government, uh, which is part of the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability. Um, our office is responsible for enforcing the Open Meetings Act. Um, we are a small but mighty team, and I think most of my team members are here. Um, we have Chief Counsel uh, Johnny Barton, who's here. Uh, I see we have um, Attorney Sheree DeBerry, who's here, and Trial Attorney Nicholas Weil, uh, who will be our presenter today. And I'd like to ask everyone to please uh, mute your line. Um, so we, we have allowed everyone to, um, to have access uh, to cameras and your microphone so that you can actively participate in this training and ask questions uh, if you have them. Um, so uh, Nicholas Weil is going to be our presenter today. Um, he is our trial attorney. So the Office of Open Government, we do have the authority uh, to bring an enforcement action in uh, the Superior Court, which you hear about, which we very seldom do. We focus on education, and that's why you're here today. Uh, we want you to learn about the Open Meetings Act and embrace it. Um, most of you are probably already doing most of it. Um, so today, um, what you will hear is information that is going to allow you to have the most effective meetings and uh, meetings that comply uh, with the Open Meetings Act, or what we call OMA uh, for short. And um, all of our staff is here. I see also uh, Kimberly Brown, our paralegal, has joined us. Um, and we are an open and friendly staff. That's why we're the Office of Open Government. So if you ever have any questions, um, about the Open Meetings Act. And once you learn it today, uh, if you have a question during the presentation, as Attorney Weil said, please make sure to, to ask those questions as he, as he said in the chat, preferably. Um, and with that said, I will turn it over to uh, Attorney Weil. Thank you, Director Allen. Thanks everybody for joining. The, the references you see there are, uh, for your for your future reference, hence the name. The and yes, these these slides will be available. The there's a compliance checklist uh, mentioned there at the bottom that'll be a going forward e ready reference of the topics we're, we're we're talking today. So as I always like to say, this is a 101 level course. Uh, apologies in advance if I tell you anything you already know, but I'm going to try to really strike a, a comprehensive but but basic level uh, compliance scope today. So if uh, if I if I say anything that you happen to know along the way, that means you're you're ahead of the curve, and and that's a great problem to have. So I'm uh, I'm going to err on the side of, of uh, comprehensiveness, but hopefully pace it well and move it along. And like I said, keep it keep it interactive and, and post any any questions. I'll check the chat from, from time to time. All right, so you've got your, uh, so these references here that we're, we're going to be talking about the Open Meetings Act, uh, which is Title IV of, of the Administrative Procedure Act. And it has some uh, regulations as well that, that were promulgated by by our office, by off the Office of Open Government. And those two documents, those two codes are refreshingly readable. And uh, so you come come to us for, uh, for any advice in interpreting them, but uh, for, the, for the sake of, of yourselves and being able to share with your, with your, with your attorneys, the, these links will take you directly to the references and the primary sources that I'm taking my my content from today. And the aforesaid OMA, the Open Meetings Act, starts with this preamble. And it's a it's a it's a public policy statement and it's a rule of construction. Sort of when in when in doubt err on the side of of inclusion, transparency, openness. The public policy of the district is that all persons are entitled to full and complete information regarding the affairs of government and the actions of those who represent them. And I'd just like to underscore that word, 
all persons. Uh, just like with DC FOIA, you may know you don't have to be a DC resident to make a, a FOIA request, and y you don't have to be a, a DC resident to attend attend a meeting uh, that is required to be open under under the Open Meetings Act. So. The Open Meetings Act doesn't distinguish or discriminate on the on on the basis of where one happens to live. All that means that means all persons, and there will be op obviously opportunities to close the meeting, close a, a meeting or a portion of a meeting for legally acceptable reasons, and we'll and we'll come back to those. But we start from this baseline of of openness. And, yeah, let me see here. There we go what is what is a meeting a meeting the open meetings act defines uh, meetings to be a gatherings of a quorum of a public body and that uh, the gathering can be can be remote it can be in person it can be an emergency meeting it can be a special meeting a monthly meeting uh, any of those gatherings is a meeting for oma purposes as long as it consists of a quorum and the members consider conduct or advise on public business and uh, again note there at the bottom it's regardless of whether it's in person by telephone electronically uh, or by other means of communication so yes your meetings can be held remotely and the and those those meetings are still those remote meetings are still meetings for purposes of the oma and subject to the same compliance terms what uh, and let me let me say something about quorum before we move on there quorums are you can you can if it's defined by your your enabling charter if it's defined in your in your own bylaws uh, you can or by stand if it's not if it's not defined by your enabling charter you can define a quorum in in your own bylaws it doesn't have to be a majority unless the unless a, a supervening law or your charter says so if your charter doesn't say so you can adopt you can you can adopt a quorum of of the size that you choose but by default and under parliamentary law the a majority is the is the default and remember that a majority means more than 50 percent so if you've got a if you've got a 12 person board majority means seven not six what is a what is not a meet and uh, not a meeting we, we said a meeting is a gathering of a quorum of a public body and but a, that does not count a chance or social gathering uh, where no business is, is discussed a, my my colleagues often use the the example of running running into each other in Costco. I like that one. If the, if your board your board need not panic should 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 your members even a quorum of your members uh, run into each other in in Costco, uh, but do not discuss discuss the weather, discuss the upcoming cookout, but do not devolve into public business that would need to wait for a meeting that that complies with the uh with the oma a press conference doesn't count as a meeting an email exchange uh doesn't doesn't count as a meeting the and another thing about and this kind of relates to the quorum discussion a a committees or subcommittees if your if your charter board has has committees or those committees have subcommittees as long as they're not big enough to comprise a quorum of the whole uh then they don't they don't count you're you're obviously welcome and encouraged to exercise transparency and open them to the public to the uh extent that you can but that's beyond the the scope of the OMA. Let me, pardon me, let me check the chat. Good, everybody's 
everybody's spellbound so far. No, uh, no questions yet. Now, uh, all right. Sorry. Let me move. Let's move this along. Did I? I need to move my. Okay, move this window out of the way so I can see which slides I'm showing you. Okay, meeting is not that. There we go. What is a public body? So we so again we've got what's a what's a meeting? A meeting is a gathering of a quorum of a public body. We've talked about what a ga a ga we know what a gathering is as long as it's not chance or social. Of a quorum, we talked about what a quorum is. Of a public body, what's a public body for purposes of purposes of the OMA? A public body is a government council, board, a commission, or a similar entity, and that includes charter school boards. Uh, thanks to a just a, a 2020 amendment, but it doesn't it doesn't include certain uh, enumerated excluded groups. So the ANCs just by by statute the ANCs are not covered under the OMA. They have their own similar openness. Uh, provision under the, under the AMC law, but it's, uh, but they're not under the OMA. Neither are the DC courts, by the way. What does open mean? Uh, you have to be open to the public by default. Open, uh, note that it doesn't have to uh, mean physical presence, and this is particularly relevant now, you know, with the, with the pandemic still floating around us. These these tell those pictures of old television. These are televisions, by the way, uh, for for those who are uh, too too young to recognize them. The they're cathode cathode ray televisions, and you don't there's you don't have to have a physical presence. Open doesn't mean the uh, there's a literal door open to the public. That is one way to accomplish openness. Uh, be physically open to the public or even just the news media. Open a physical door to the news media. Uh, but televising is is a way. Uh, the OCT, FME, the uh, Office of Cable Television, uh, can 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 stream. That's that's one way. That's one method that the that the DC Council uses, as you know, if you have their uh, DC Council channel on cable. And the in during the pandemic, there was this fourth prong added to this, which is the public body. And this is a so uh, prong one: public presence. Prong two: news media presence. Prong three: televise it. Or prong four. If you don't want to televise it, but you want to say stream it on on YouTube, the prong four is the public body takes steps reasonably calculated to allow the public to view or hear the meeting while the meeting is taking place, taking a place, or if doing so is not technologically feasible, as soon thereafter as reasonably practicable. Practicable. In other words, streaming it is is an acceptable way to make it open to the public, even if it's not formally on television per se. Okay. Notice, as you, as you may know, so the, the focus of the OMA, it's the Open Meetings Act. We've talked about how to make your meetings open, but another aspect of openness is sort of paper openness. You got to give give the public notice of the meeting so that they know where, so that they know if if they're interested in the subject matter of your meeting, and they have to be able to review afterwards the the what what happened in your meeting. So openness has a has a past, present, and future component to it. And we have a concept in the law called constructive notice. So no, constructive notice means you got your actual notice, which is you go around and knock on every door in the city and say, hey, we've got a meeting in, in a week. Just so, just so you know, you're on notice now. Okay, is there a, is there a, a child here? Is there a spouse here? Okay, let, hey, we got a meeting in two weeks. So all those people are on actual notice. Uh, and you so see, you could do that and go around and give actual notice to every house in the district, but that's obviously, obviously absurd. So we have a concept in the law called constructive notice, which is you, you just 
you, you post the notice, you put the notice where anybody who's interested would be able to go and find it. And, and, and thus you've put the whole world on legal notice of, of the fact that you're having this meeting. And so how does that work? How do we put the whole world on legal notice that we're having this meeting uh, in, in, a, in a couple of days, in a couple of weeks? The, the requirement is that you, that you post onto the website of, of your own body, of, 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 the, of the Charter Board's own website, or on the website of the district government, which means the central meeting calendar. You may have seen that, uh, remember that reference slide I showed you at the beginning, that uh, so open-dc.gov open, uh, open is the in, you know, houses among other things the central meeting calendar we'll, we'll come back to how you can register for that you, could, you can register for the central meeting calendar by emailing kavan bridges our it specialist and we'll, we'll come back to that but you can also just use your own website the website of the public body itself the there is a D, there is a register you have to publish in the register if you're if you're a public body but that doesn't apply to the the charter boards because of the newness of uh of the situation that the council uh exempted the individual charter schools boards from publishing their notices in the register so all you've got to worry about is posting on the website of the public body or district government and yes there can be emergencies there can be last minute uh, there can be a, a need to meet as a last minute, and we'll come back to that. So these notices, holding aside the emergency situation for a second, you have to supply no, as much notice as possible, uh, but it has to be at least 48 hours or two business days, whichever is greater. When and provide as much notice as possible. This is our this is our best practice recommendation that will ensure sufficient time to correct a defective notice and not preclude a meeting from occurring. So one of our jobs is to go around and help you. I like the way that our ethics board member, Mr. Sobin, puts it that we're not a we're not a gotcha agency. We're a help you agency. We, we we go around and we monitor ahead of time so that if if it's if it's coming up on 50 hours before your your you got a meeting Wednesday at 10 a.m. and it's Monday at 9 a.m. or or maybe Friday night we'll take a we'll take a look and and try to help you out and help you if we've noticed that a, a notice is absent from our website and yours we can't guarantee you, but we'll try to help you notice uh, notice this and take care of it in time so you, so the meeting can go forward this happens regularly and it feels it feels great when we when we help that happen when we help a, a body be able to to carry out the meeting without having to cancel it because uh because of defective notice emergency before we go on uh so an emergency when an emergency meeting is convened the the obviously the whole point of the concept of an emergency means you're not able to provide that full 48 hour two business day notice whenever you do realize that there's an emergency and it's going to be necessary to call it, call an emergency uh, you need to provide notice to the public at the same time as as you provide notice to the other members of the board. I say that again, because it's uh, it's missing from this slide. I'll fix that on the slide before I send them out. You have to provide notice to the public at the same time as you provide notice to your fellow uh, board members of the meeting, even though it's gonna be obviously less than the 48 hours. Now, what is an emergency? An emergency, and we have an advisory opinion, one of our OOG advisory opinions that helps construe this provision. An emergency meeting, quote, 
ordinarily involves an unexpected situation or sudden occurrence of a serious nature, such as an event that threatens public health and safety. But no, every, not every unexpected or sudden event constitutes an emergency. That's from a uh, advisory opinion from earlier this year, from February. Okay, what what does the notice include? Remember, this is uh, this is legal notice. Not, this is constructive notice, not banging on the door. Legal notice must include time, date, location, and planned agenda, especially with remote meetings. Location can mean the uh, the hyperlink if you don't have a. A physical location where you're meeting, give us the give us the hyperlink. And that, again, that doesn't have to mean active participation. We'll come back to this, but you're not required to invite the public to participate. You're not required to have a public comment period. Maybe you do so in your own bylaws, and and, and we'll come back to that. But that's not an OMA problem. That's that's your own internal procedure. So you can your location can be YouTube. Your location can be channel 13 your location can be passive uh, as long as the public is able to view not necessarily participate and it has to include a planned agenda i realize that many bodies will adopt the agenda as as, as when they start when they start the meeting uh, although you know get them get the agenda together 48 hours in advance so that the the public can can tell can anticipate what's going to be talked about in the meeting there aren't going to be surprises and they they know if they're if they're going to be interested to follow along to attend uh, so even if you sort of formally adopt the planned agenda at the beginning of your meeting you have to at least publish that draft agenda as as a portion of your of your notice and if there will be if you plan to close portion of the meeting then the notice has to announce has to pre-announce the this the general subjects that you're going to be covered during the closure if you're going to be disciplining a, a teacher uh i'm i'm just making i'll just use my own name uh you, you don't your agenda doesn't have to say we're disciplining nicholas weil uh, but the the citation the oma citation has to be given and uh, we'll come back to we'll come back to the individual reasons so circumscribe generally what what the subject of that closure is going to be and what should the notice include oh so next slide here so the file and and the so we what do we have date time location and or web link planned agenda and at the bottom of the agenda include this statement the meeting is governed this meeting is governed by the open meetings act please address any questions or complaints arising out of this meeting to the Office of Open Government at open.gov office at dc.gov. And uh, that, you know, that's to alert, that's to alert the public about our existence and what, what where do they go if they have a, a problem, a compliance concern. Okay, so we have a question in chat. And the question is, many boards take motions to modify the agenda at the beginning of the meeting, sometimes to deal with a late breaking situation. Does this conflict with notice requirements? I That's a very good question. And I asked Director Allen for guidance on this recently, and her answer was no, it does not conflict with notice requirements. The... Just double check the Q&A. Okay, Q&A is, is silent. Thank you folks for, for using the chat window. So I can only keep one of them open at, the at a time here. Let me get my chat window open again. Okay, closed meeting justification. So this is, uh, so this is when, it's, when it's okay to close down. Got a list here and a lot of these are, are applicable to education, to the schools, so. You can close when the when a court tells you to, when a statute tells you to. There's there's several bodies. I uh, we just had a 
a new one yesterday. There are some there are some public bodies that where the entire meeting by statute is, is closed and not subject to the Open Meetings Act. So that obviously supersedes the the OMA if if that applies. But there uh, that that doesn't apply to to charter to charter school boards. The contract negotiations, trade secrets, attorney client privilege. Note that the mere fact that there is an attorney in the room doesn't establish attorney to attorney client privilege. And um, having strangers in the room would destroy attorney client privilege too, which is which is the reason for enabling this closure. But uh, Consult with your attorney if you're going to invoke invoke privilege, because merely having an attorney on the board or in the room doesn't make the whole conversation privileged or subject to closure of the meeting. Public health or safety, under circumstances where disclosing the information would would endanger the public, uh, such as talking about escape escape plans, escape routes, that sort of thing to prevent premature disclosure of an award. If you wanna keep an honorary certificate quiet so that you can surprise the person. And then I, I grouped together several of the exemptions that kind of fall under this basket of admin exams, preparing for preparing for licensure exams. That's the, whether it's a bar exam, whether it's a, a, a teacher certifi certification type of exam. Uh, if, if there needs to be some, if your whole board needs to ha sit, sit and discuss contents of some sort of standardized, standardized test for students, uh, you obviously don't want that information to get out ahead of time. So that's, that's an acceptable reason for closure. Students' personal, identi personally identifying information, charter evaluations, if the charter, if your charter school is being evaluated say by the PCA district Y PCSB. So I've got um, those four stars there, four asterisks point to some notes. So when I when I circulate this slideshow, all of these individual reasons will be in the notes there for you. But these admin reasons are I'll just go through them very quickly. They're short. Preparation, administration, or grading of scholastic licensing or qualifying examinations to discuss disciplinary matters. That was the hypothetical we had before. So you could move to close down the meeting under 2-575B9 uh, to discuss disciplinary matters. We're disciplining an employee. We're not going to, and you don't have to say my name. Re, that's reason nine. Reason 10 is to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, performance evaluation, compensation, discipline, demotion, removal, or resignation of government em appointees, employees, or officials, or of charter school personnel. And if someone has asked, does the disclaimer need to appear on all open notices or just the emergency. I, I assume you're asking about the, this meeting is governed by the Open Meetings Act and address your complaints to the OOG. The answer is yes, all notices. Uh, draft, and, draft and final agenda is what the, under draft and final agenda is what the regulation says. So we were on reason 10. Reason 12 is to train and develop members of a public member, uh, to train and develop training of uh, members of a public body and staff. You don't have to op open your internal trainings to, to the whole public. To plan, discuss, or hear reports concerning ongoing or planned investigations of alleged criminal or civil misconduct or violations of law or regulations. If if disclosure to the public would harm the investigation. And of, of course that might fall under attorney client privilege too, but not necessarily. So this, this is separately enumerated reason. And again, all these reasons will be, all these admin reasons will be under the, in the notes of the slideshow. 
to discuss matters involving personally identifiable information of students. So I already talked about that. And uh, for the board of trustees of a charter school to meet with the staff of an eligible chartering authority for the purpose of being evaluated by the eligible chartering authority. I already, yeah, I already mentioned that. As well. Okay, good. Now, so you've, you've, let's assume you've, you've established your reason for closure. We're going to, we're going to have to close part of this meeting down. How do we, how do we carry that out? Meetings, sometimes I notice meetings seem kind of stodgy and awkward about this. There's a lot of hyperformalism and, and unsure behavior around this. Parliamentary procedure is supposed to make is supposed to make the meeting run smoother and more confidently, not bog it down with sort of hyper formalism. So I suggest you develop a script. And if you need a script for this, contact the OOG and we can sort of help you help you create one. Uh, if it's on the agenda, you know, you don't you know the, the chairperson can can make their own motion. The chairperson doesn't have to sort of ask for a motion we've we've already come to that part of the agenda you've you, by definition you've announced it on your agenda okay we've come to item four on our agenda which as we previously announced it's the it's it's closure to talk about disciplining one of our one of our staff members uh, so without objection let's uh, let's take a vote if there's any if there's ever any discussion on it you know the chair can entertain discussion but the chair doesn't have to sort of wait wait for a, a motion and have this awkward have this awkward pause uh it's already it's already on the agenda so i can i'm getting a little bit into the into the weeds here let me let me back this out if you need a script if you want to feel more comfortable with parliamentary procedure contact me contact the oog and we can we can help you with that script so here's how you go into closure uh start start the meeting as usual conduct as much of your business as as possible openly as in our hypothetical item four is is a, is a closure for discipline so items one through three are presumably items that you're gonna that you're gonna discuss in in the open portion of the meeting then Recall that the closed session, as we said, will have been on your notice already. We'll have already noticed it up. So when the closed session item comes up, the chairperson uh, can ask for a motion to close or, as I said, can put their own motion to close. The, the motion uh, must include a statement of the reasons for closure, citations for those reasons, and the subjects to be discussed, generally speaking, while in closure. If there's no discussion, put the question, which means take the vote. You got to take a roll call vote for this. Under uh, all uh, votes have to be roll call anyway for for remote meetings. Uh, but even if you're meeting in person and you're closing down to the public, this has to be a roll call vote going into closure. And the OMA requires that you record the roll and the chairs statement the chair statement being that bit about the motion is that we close due to reason uh reason number what was it nine to discuss a disciplinary matter of one of our staff those have to be recorded in writing and one more uh one more point about this especially when you're writing your agenda executive session stay away from from that term executive session just just call it closure i think executive session is one of those sort of legal and legalese unnecessarily formal terms that doesn't actually mean what people think it means even in the u.s senate the executive session is open to the public it just means discussion of nominations to judgeships or the executive branch i don't know how that leaked into sort of colloquial parlance but you're not um, to, to just say closure that's a, a needless bit of fanciness that's that's a misnomer and that's what the statute calls it anyways closed session so if you want to track what the what the oma what the statute says you can just feel comfortable with that term closed session now uh 
when you go into closure, only discuss matters that are that were noticed in the agenda. Um, you don't don't drift from what you've given notice to the public on. So that's that's a bit of an the, uh, the my friend who asked earlier about changing the agenda. That's that's one very important exception. Don't uh, don't drift into other on other subjects that weren't noticed up to the public. Once you're in closure, you still have to record the meeting. We'll come back to this the electronic recording. You got to record your meetings, and even the closed portion, uh, you can isolate it if you want. You can take a separate recording, but you still got to re record it. When the closed agenda items are exhausted, the closed body returns to. So when you're when you're done, you can uh, you can come back out and report any. A, any matters that are relevant to the public. If you disciplined, if you disciplined me in closure, you don't have to come back out and say we fired Nicholas Weil. Uh, you don't have to. You don't have to say you fired anybody. That that's up to your internal practices. But if you if you want to re report out matters that are applicable to the public, that's when you do that after you've risen. Recording requirements is the next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, if 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 feasible, meetings must be recorded by electronic means. If if not feasible, if you have if you have trouble with with technology, uh, contact us, and and we can help you. But uh, it's it's harder and harder to to imagine. A lack of feasibility of, of making a recording. And that, that recording can be can be audio or video. And there's there's a five year retention requirement. You have to hang on to that recording for five years. But that's that's under the OMA. But note that any you might have your own policy that's longer than that. Uh, policies imposed by the Office of the Secretary, the the citywide general retention schedules apply to all sorts of records so follow follow obviously the strictest policy that's imposed uh, by any of the applicable law and consult with your legal staff before disposing of anything best practice there the and note okay that's good uh transcripts you could so if if recording is not feasible you can you can report out, you can post a transcript uh, that that transcript if that transcript isn't going to be and the the way the regulation says if that transcript isn't going to be available uh, within the within a seven day window then post detailed minutes within three days you got to post detailed minutes and we'll come back to what what detail means in a, in a few minutes here. Publication requirements. Okay. Because because your charter school boards, you get um, scratch what I said. Scratch what I said about three days with the minutes. Because your charter boards, you get thirty business days. Thirty business days. Uh, if the recording is not feasible, your minutes, at least the draft version, must be publicly available no later than thirty business days after the meeting. Uh, and you have to note that once the final minutes are approved, we get this question a, a lot that, well, the, the board has to meet again to approve the minutes. Yes, um, often when I say minutes, I, I, I'm trying to work on, on getting into a better habit of saying draft minutes. Uh, yes, the final approved minutes uh, will, will replace those draft minutes, but your draft minutes have to be up within uh, 30 business days. And then the, the full record has to be available to to the public. Uh, full record means uh, full record means motion. We'll come back to this, but this is in the regulations. Any any motions, any amendments there to roll call votes, the transcript, a copy of the full record has to be available for public inspection as soon as practicable, but not later than seven business days after the meeting. Okay. And like I said, register, publicate, DC register publication doesn't apply to the 
charter boards, but you might hear others uh, talking about that. So other other public bodies do have that as well. What is uh, what is a minute? <laughs> This is this is from this is a I like that this is a paraphrasing of Robert's rules here. And again, if you need any any training or advice on public on parliamentary procedure, you can ask us. There are other manuals in Robert's rules, but I like the way that they uh, that they express this. So minutes should should contain what was not what what was done, not what was said. It doesn't have to be a, a transcript. Uh, you don't have to record anybody who seconds a, a motion. It usually, and I go into this in a more advanced training, but you usually don't have to call for a second of a motion. Uh, and if and if somebody does second the motion, you don't have to record the name of that seconder, and you probably shouldn't, because the fact that you second a motion doesn't mean you're in favor of it. It just means you want to debate it. You want to vote on it, maybe to vote it down. So don't tag a seconder with responsibility for the motion uh, because it doesn't necessarily, the fact that they second it doesn't necessarily mean they were in favor of it. Okay. And uh, the more, the finer points of the finer points of parliamentary procedure, I, like I said, if you're interested in, you can, you can ask us about that. Let's go on here. Uh, there are, and there's a regulatory requirement. DC's um, are the OOG's regulations have certain requirements for uh, your minutes. The date, time, and place of the meeting or session, the names of the members of the public body recorded as present or absent, any motions and amendments thereto, record of votes taken, and a general description of all matters concerned. There's a question. Don't don't minutes have to be published even if there is a recording? The short, uh, answer is no. Rec uh, the the recording is the is the umbrella is the umbrella record. If a recording is is not feasible, uh, then the then the transcript or minutes uh, substitute. Did I get that right, Mr. Barton, Chief Counsel? And um, let me go on here. Public comment. No public comment period is required by the OMA or its regulations. You may allow public comment in, in, in terms of your own internal parliamentary parliamentary law. Maybe you have a standing order permitting it. And if you do, you know, apply it equitably, apply it fairly, obviously. Um, a lot of, uh, we, we get a lot of, we get a lot of complaints and concerns about public comment, and it's not under the scope of the OMA. Uh, but that's not to say it, it doesn't, it doesn't present a, a, a political concern for you, an internal concern for you. So if you do allow, you don't have to allow public comment. If you do, remember to apply it uh, equitably and predictably. But that's beyond the scope of the OMA and OOG. Complaints. Okay, so if you steer from the straight and narrow, what what happens? A, a an aggrieved party, including anonymous parties, including members of the public. Uh, can complain to OOG for relief. And that can be prospective. They can say, hey, look, the, the, these folks are, I, I heard through the grapevine or my neighbors on the, one of these boards, and they're going to meet tomorrow. And they didn't, you know, I, I checked this, I check their website every day because I, I want to be on notice. I want to be on actual notice if there's going to be a subject that I'm, I'm interested in. And yet, you know, yesterday they didn't, they didn't have it up there. And today I find out this evening they're, they're meeting on a subject that I'm interested in. And I've already uh, scheduled an appointment to get a uh, Manny Petty. So, this is a prospective violation. It's happening in the future. Do I have to wait for the violation to occur 
before I am do I before I have standing to do anything about? The answer is no. Prospective future violations that haven't happened yet can be brought to the attention of OOG. Um, and the uh, let's see, okay, and and if um, so, the like I said, the the, fu the future vi the future violation we can act quickly on the the past violation, which is which is most of them. Uh, someone will bring a complaint to us and say that that a public body improperly closed. They didn't uh, notice up their meeting correctly. When we get one of those complaints, we notify you. You have 30 days to respond. Uh, you, can, you can get a possible extension of up to five business days after that. And once the sort of record is record is complete, then the the director can try to conciliate between the parties, can dismiss the complaint if it, you know, it's meritless, or she can release an advisory opinion. And if it's, especially if it's a uh, a pattern or a pattern or practice, it can as as Director Allen mentioned at the start, can bring bring suit in Superior Court. And note that this complaint process is different from the private right of action under the so-called Sunshine Act. So, as you may know, there's a long, uh, way older than the OMA is a, is is. Section 42A of the Home Rule Act is the Sunshine Act, and that it's a much more generic, but it allows members of the public to to sue you for for violation of the presumption of openness in in your meetings. Okay. The what is an APC, and what do they do? An administrative point of contact is not necessarily a member of the board, and I, I think it's safe to say usually isn't, uh, a, a, a personnel member who interacts with the OOG, who is our liaison. Uh, you have to establish a APC. You, you do so, and I, I clarify with Mr. Bridges, our, our IT specialist, about the preferred uh, technique for doing this before this meeting and you email him his his contact info will be at the end i think it's just kavan.bridges run.bridges at um, dc.gov and you tell him your name the public body that you wish to have access to the central meeting calendar and we'll, we'll help you with training you on how to do that mr bridges will and if you've already, there's a small handful that already are registered. If you're one of those charter boards that already is 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 registered, you can uh, tell him that that you've already that you've already gotten. You're just replacing somebody else. You're replacing an APC who came before you. And speaking of that, whenever APC changes, keep us up to date on who the new administrative point of contact is so that we can keep that up to date on our website and you're required under our regs to have training anytime there's a new anytime there's new personnel and this applies to a new board member to new board member or uh, new apc must be trained within 60 days of their onboarding but note that Everybody in the everybody in the public, members of the public body, not just the APC, are responsible for compliance with the OMA. So, help your APC help you by 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 being proactive about about compliance. And like I said, there's that that great checklist that's in the in the notes at the beginning that we got a link to that compliance checklist. And everybody has to complete OMA training. All all members of the public body have to complete annual OMA training. So that, so congratulations. You're very close to. We got seven minutes here. You're almost done. You're very close to completing that annual compliance, the annual training. Okay. Next thing for access to. OG central meeting calendar. Okay. 
The OMA also permits the use of a public body's own site for posting these records. OOG offers the CMC as an alternative and for convenience and uniformity. And Director Allen covered this already. Uh, the the OOG can bring loss, a lawsuit in superior court and that can range, that can be, a, there can be a $250 fine for a pattern of, of improper closure. There can be injunctive and declaratory relief, meaning the court can void out actions that you've taken in a meeting in violation of the OMA. So avoid those, avoid those legal consequences and come to us as your help you agency and not your gotcha agency. The Office of Open Government thanks you. And here's our contact information. I've been Nick. I've been your friendly trial attorney from the Office of Open Government. And we've got uh, five minutes to answer any questions. Or if you if you're saying goodbye, then I wish you I wish you goodbye. But thank you very very much for everybody's uh, attention. Uh, Chief Counsel Barton, anything I've missed? General Counsel Cheatham, anything I've missed? No, but I I was going to ask. Uh, thank you very much for this training. In terms of the annual training requirement for school board members, is there a way that I know we recorded this meeting, for example, and it will be available on your website? Uh, is there a way for board members to take or view that virtual recorded training and uh, document that somehow in terms of receiving that annual training, or does it need to be a live training? Is that the the statute good question the statute doesn't require that it that it be live um chief counsel barton any any input on procedure for that we'll work with you on that um I, i'm getting a, a virtual um training so that that the requirement can be met um, and, and probably work on having some kind of form that they can fill out just attesting that they watched the whole thing. Um, uh, Chief Counsel Barton, you have anything to add? You're muted. Can't hear you, sir. Try control M. And I have to jump off. I have another meeting, but thank you everyone, everyone <laughs> for, um, for joining and attending. Thanks, Director Allen. Sorry, Mr. Barr, we're not, we're not hearing you. Uh, <laughs> oh, there is, there is. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, check the chat again. So we got some thank yous. What would constitute annual? Okay, what would constitute annual training? Um, I mean, so uh, let me add that. Yeah, this is the 101 level training. Uh, Mr. Barton's doing more advanced training this afternoon. So if you if you want to, if you've mastered the the basics and you want to go in deeper, uh, there are trainings like that. Like I said, there's parliamentary training. Or, uh, we're having a specific parliamentary procedure session, I think December, early, first week of December. So the, the, the short answer is the statute doesn't specify live or on demand. That's uh, uh, beyond my pay grade, but uh, it, it doesn't say that it has to be, you have to take this one over and over and over again. So th that's not how I, I would construe it. I guess my question is just because I think our schools are, I'm with the DC Charter Alliance, and I think our schools are unaware of any kind of training requirement for board members, like all their board members. Um, so if it's a requirement, then we need to know what is required. So do they just get, I mean, can they just say they've done any training? 
Could the school offer training? Could the DC Alliance or the PCSB offer training? Or would it have to be this specific session? And would it have to be more than this session? Like a series of beginner advanced parliamentary procedure? Um, I, I think we need to know exactly what's required. That's that's very that's very fair. Uh, my, I'll I'll let Chief Counsel Barton uh, respond. But it, I the if you're not new, there's taking this one, taking this beginner one over and over again, uh, isn't I wouldn't think is necessary. That like I said, a more a more advanced training would would certainly support substitute but at least at least this one uh once a year yes mr barton can't hear you sir yes where we lost you again Um, can't hear you, Mr. Barton, but in the meantime, let me try. Okay, there's a question. Please confirm if board mem if board meetings are recorded and the recording is published, written minutes do not have to be published. That is true. Of course, in the interest of depending on how long the meeting, I know that there are some public bodies who meet for eight hours. And they publish, you know, publishing an unannotated recording of eight hours where one would have to listen to the entire thing in order to find the it's 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 not the most transparent practice, but it's it's OMA compliant. But I invite you to observe the spirit of the laws, they say, and 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 be transparent and and, and offer roadmaps and guideposts. But the short answer is your question is is correct mr barton <laughs> sorry but uh, I'll, i can uh, like i said i'll okay well i'll let you go because we're we've, we've had the we've had our you've met your you've met your hour and uh and off we go but i will i will uh let you I will I will send you the links and the and the checklist and all the good stuff. So thank you very much for all your attention and patience and uh, have a have a great one. Uh, thanks so much, Nick. And I would also say, yeah, just as as Johnny put in the chat there, um, this piece specifically about training requirements sounds like something that um, OOG will need to follow up on and PCSB will certainly work to help make sure that information is communicated. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, okay. And I will I will make a note of the request to add an extra name to the uh, distribution list. Okay. Thank you. Have a have a great day, everyone.